Jessica Murphy, welcome to the Running Effect Podcast. How are you doing? I would say afternoon, morning for you. How are you doing morning in Hawaii? Uh, I am doing great. It's a morning where I actually didn't wake up to run or work out. I just kind of dove right into work. And sometimes it's kind of nice to just wake up and be like, I don't have to go somewhere and be active. Um, I don't know if you ever feel like that. Like, are you normally a morning runner? I dabble. I'm kind of in a unique situation in life at the moment where I'm taking a little bit more of a step back from running. So I'll run mm -hmm. most days of the week, but it's very unstructured for as far or however fast I want to go. Whereas when I'm training for something, yeah, I'm generally morning or if I have to run twice a day, obviously you have to go in the morning. Yeah. So it's kind of dependent. Actually, a question for you off of that, that I'm very curious to hear about because of this chapter of life where I'm like less stressed about getting miles in. Um, do you ever feel the need as like a business owner and as someone who's building a lot of things within the space, like to just do your work right away? Or if you run or work out, because it actually takes quite a lot of time, you do you ever feel stressed when you're in your morning miles and you're like, man, I've got 10 emails to respond to. So dovetailing off of that, we talked about, I'm actually based in Hawaii. So right now we are three hours behind Pacific, six hours behind Eastern. So the mornings always start out super hot. Uh, but I do like to work out in the morning. I find I'm the most consistent and I feel the most, I don't want to say motivated, but I find a lot of ways to talk myself out of a workout throughout the day. But if I just like wake up and go out the door, it's like, again, the most consistent I'll be. So I wake up, I'll kind of check Slack to see like if anybody needs anything from me, either the team or any client emails that are urgent. Then my morning routine is like I go out, I drive to the gym. Um, my husband who started the business with me, his name is Tim. We're CrossFitters, but we still run because we're like never going to lose that part of our DNA. So we go, we run around the gym, we do our class and we come and we work a nine to five. Um, if there's something crazy that's gone off the rails, then we'll kind of work and then work out in the afternoon. Or if I have an early morning meeting with a client, then I will work, you know, wake up, work from six to three and then run and work out in the afternoon. But it's always hotter in the afternoon, as we all know. So to me, it's just way better to do it in the morning. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume work is your passion. And because of that, your number one priority. How have you balanced work being your priority and your passion with also a passion for working out and running? Because I'm kind of in this chapter, maybe this episode is turning into like Q and A, Dominic asks Jessica all his issues that he's going through. A lot, a lot of times for me, it's like figuring out, man, like I only have so much time and work is my top priority and should be in this stage of life, but I also want to run and work out. How do you balance those two things where, you know, work takes a lot of time? That's a great question. I am very comfortable living like an integrated lifestyle where I've worked from home for most of my professional career, which is more common now, but when I started my career like 20 years ago, uh, it was not very common, but I'm comfortable like waking up, checking stuff right away, going out for a run, checking stuff, going into the gym, checking stuff. And some people carry that stress through them, like through, and they won't be able to focus on their run or they won't be able to focus on the gym. Um, I like that because if I know, hey, I've addressed everything that needs to get addressed. I saved what needs to get taken care of later. And I kind of know that's coming. I feel better, but our team like at Bib Brave, we do a lot of conversations about like work styles because everybody's different. And for some people, I'm like, if you need to turn off your notification, turn it off and then don't look at anything until nine o'clock. Cause if that's going to make you feel like you're working all the time and lead to like just a bad work-life balance, then that's not going to work for you. But for me, I don't mind it. And part of it is I do love what I do. And so I don't always find it as like work. Um, so I, yeah, I think it's individual. Jessica, be honest with me here. Do you reply to texts and emails when you're out running? Sometimes here's the thing. I'm not like I do, training, I do, by the way, I'm not, I feel bad about it, but I do it all the time. Well, yeah. I'm not training to like run a certain speed or run a certain time in a race anymore. So any excuse to stop a run and just like, let me take a breather. This looks like I need to take a picture of this. Oh, somebody needs something. Uh, I, I was like a late in life runner and I used to think, oh, if I'm going to run a marathon, I can't stop in the middle of my training run because I'm not going to stop and walk during the marathon. That wasn't my goal. My goal was to run the whole thing. But now with experience, I've realized it doesn't matter if you stop as long as you're getting the miles, that's what matters. And now I'm not even training for any like goal or distance. So yeah, just stop and 
do the thing if it's going to make you feel better. If it's not going to make you feel better, then wait to address it later. I'm a little psychopathic and I'll try to text while running and I will say I've gotten pretty darn good at it. So I'm impressed. I yeah. would drop my phone on the ground. So if really? anything, I this is how casual I've gotten. Maybe you'll have opinions on this. I now don't run with my Garmin anymore. I run with my Apple Watch, which to me is like a very big sign of where my running life has gone. So I, if I do, I'll try voice to text. But I also sometimes that gets all messed up. <laughs> very fair. Very fair. I'm also curious to hear about from the business perspective as someone who's had a much longer career than me and who owns your own thing as well. People say, you know, if you own your own thing, you'll never have a day off. Like you're all, you always got something to reply to. Your mind's always spinning on taking it to the next level. Have you gotten to the point yet where you can take some time off and completely shut off your brain? And if so, what was the path to get there and the process to get there? Yes and no. I do think, so again, it, it's a little different because like I own my business with my husband. So like if we're going on vacation, it's still the two of us and we like running our business. So, but I, I do think we've learned like if we're not in a business setting, we have to ask each other permission to talk about work because just because I'm okay talking about it doesn't mean he's okay talking about it. So we'll be like, can I talk about work right now? And if the other person says no, and we kind of wait until it's an appropriate work time. Uh, but I don't know if I ever completely shut off, but I don't, but we do take a lot of vacation. So it's a balance. I'm like, if, if we weren't gone all the time, then when we were gone, we probably ha would have to be more strict about like fully shutting off. But again, we tend to be okay with a more integrated life and other people are not. And if that's the case, then they should completely shut off and not think about it at all. Before we get too deep into the weeds, take me through as you know, general or specific you want to be, what you do, what company you own. People are probably putting together the pieces a little bit off of these first seven minutes and whatever I'll say in the intro, but what do you do? What do you do for a living and what have you created within the space? Yes, yeah, sorry. I dove right into talking about details, but uh, I am the co-founder of a marketing agency called Bibrave. We uh, started 12 years ago and right now we have like three lines of business. Uh, the first line of business is we do influencer and ambassador marketing for brands, mostly in the running and fitness space. And obviously that's how we got to meet you, Dominic. The other thing we do is experiential marketing. So we'll create brand activations either at major moments like at a major marathon or just pop up moments throughout the year on behalf of our brand partners. And then the third piece of business is we do marketing for events and races. That's actually how we started is partnering with races, mostly marathons and half marathons, often shorter distance or sometimes multi-sport to help drive registration, get the word out about their events. And when we started doing that, most of it was through what we now call nano influencers. But when we started in 2013, that wasn't a term. It was just people on Twitter. It's kind of funny. It used to be Twitter was our primary platform talking about training for a race, running it, sharing their experience with their followers. Um, so we still do that, but we also do other marketing for events as well. So 12 years into this beast, I'm so curious. I think it was a few episodes ago. Uh, I was asking about social media and how it ties into comparison. So as the guest was talking, I was on my iPhone or iPad and I looked up, when did Instagram launch? And if memory serving me correctly, I think it was October 6, 2010. So mm -hmm. just about like almost exactly 14 years ago. So you've been in the space for 12 years. At what point did Instagram start to become a bigger thing? Because I feel like that's where most people within our sport are on and flourishing. I think there's such a massive community of runners there. That's mostly where I promote the podcast. I'm not looking to too many other ventures. When do you remember the name like Instagram? And when did you start taking it seriously? We actually just did a Bit Brave Team Social uh, because everybody who works at our company is remote. Oftentimes when we're meetings, we're talking specifically about business. So every now and then we're like, let's to get, get together. We had some new teammates and everybody go around and share a little bit about themselves. So one of the questions we asked everybody is to share their very first Instagram post. And I think my first Instagram post was like fall 2012. So like a year and a half into the platform. And, you know, back then, Instagram was really just to create fun filters and frames so that you could reshare that content on Facebook. It wasn't even really to like post on Instagram. And that became more of a thing. I feel like in the 
2014, 2015 realm. And then obviously it really, really blew up when it got bought by Facebook, which is now Meta. Um, so I think it's continued to stay relevant because Meta continues to invest in it as a primary platform where you get all of these other platforms. Like, I don't even know if you even remember Vine, which was bought by Twitter. They didn't really do anything to innovate the platform. They just integrated it into Twitter and then eventually it went away and nobody even remembers what Vine is. Maybe this is just my generation and age, but I kind of consider at this point Facebook like an app for my parents' age, like 50s and above. It seems like it's just progressively falling out of popularity. And it's funny because Meta, who really started Facebook, used to just be Facebook, owns Instagram and Instagram's popping off. What's your take on uh, Facebook generally and just what apps, you know, would you, if you could like theoretically buy stock into apps, which ones are you hot on and which ones would you be like, I'm never buying stock in that? <laughs> That's a great question. Honestly, at least from our business perspective, we know Instagram and TikTok are the two primary platforms, at least in the United States. I know people still use Snap, but it's primarily like a one to one messaging platform. And honestly, Instagram kind of killed Snap because Snapchat was that one on one DMs. They created stories and then Instagram basically took that functionality and put it on their platform. And because they had a bajillion more users. That's not an exact number, but they had way more users than people just started to use that functionality on Instagram. And honestly, it as a I have mixed feelings about that. They've done a great job continuing to innovate their features, but they've also just kind of stolen features from other platforms. And that's that's a hard business to be in because you have either the user base or you have the features. But for me, Instagram and TikTok are obviously the biggest ones that I think people will continue to use, but then you have the whole like China TikTok issue. So I would be very wary of investing in TikTok because who knows if there's going to be regulation that's passed that will limit their ability to operate in the US. As someone who runs one of the most successful marketing companies within this sport, I think I hate all the time when I hear outsiders say running's not that big, running's not that popular. Can you just put, as someone who markets marathons and has done so for a while, how big is our is our sport, Jessica? Okay, this is what I tell people. I'm not going to answer your question, not because I'm trying to evade, but this is, I've been in the industry now, not only through Bibrave, but, but after uh, Tim and I launched Bibrave, it was a side project. I worked at Nike and I worked at Runner's World. And... I really got to see the industry from a brand perspective, from this publishing media perspective, and now from a marketing agency perspective. And the same issue plagues our sport. And I feel like it will continue to be an issue until we figure out how to change perception on what it means to be a runner. Hmm. So I really like explored this a lot when I was at Runner's World, because at the time the magazine had 600,000 subscribers, but you have millions of people running 5Ks, half marathons, marathons every year. And one of the biggest problems, like I did this whole workshop with my team at the time to be like, how do we get more people to subscribe to Runner's World? What magazines do you subscribe to? Now, again, this was 2016. So people still subscribe to magazines, even back in 2016. And somebody subscribed to this magazine called Real Simple, which is like a house decorating magazine. And I was like, why do you subscribe to this magazine? And she felt like this represents who I am. Like when I put it on the coffee table, this is a reflection of my identity. And that really like struck me because I think the problem is a lot of people are running, but they don't call themselves runners. Like I myself signed up for my first marathon, trained for my first marathon. I did not consider myself a runner until probably I ran my third marathon. That's when I BQ'd and then it became part of my identity. And now I'm like very proud to say I'm a runner, even though I run way less than I did when I trained for those first two marathons. So people who don't consider themselves runners don't subscribe to runner's world. They don't think they're worth buying a nice watch or they're worth, uh, you know, paying a premium subscription for Strava because that's too hardcore. And so we have this perception of like, a, a, a runner are these elite athletes, even though 99% of the industry is not an elite athlete and you're running, you have somebody who's running a, two times a week and running two miles a week, they're runners, but they don't call themselves runners. And so that will always just be the issue when it comes to like marketing product or our sport or an event is we, the way we're talking to consumers is, it has definitely changed, but it's so complicated. And I'm going to like keep talking about this. Like 
when you think about that diversity of people who run, you have people running different distances. You have people running different speeds. You have people running for different reasons, either a time goal for weight loss, for mental health. So trying to create like a message that's going to resonate with all of these different types of people is what's challenging. Um, and yeah, until we can get people to actually say that they're runners, I feel like there's always going to be this dissonance between people who run and people who want to buy things for runners. Why do you think the people who run and on paper are runners find it hard to call themselves runners? Because in my opinion, if you went out and, and ran a mile today, you're like, if you took, if you did the action of running, you are that thing. You are a runner, whether you want yeah. to be or not. So we've done a lot of market like industry landscape research at Bibrave about this recently. And back in the day, like the millennial generation, which is like my generation, it was this imposter syndrome. Like I will I'll always remember the, the first 12 miler I ever ran to train for my first marathon. I was wearing like $35 shoes from Sports Authority, which is a store some people listening to this podcast maybe you've never heard of. And so I, I was like, I got to go to my Fleet Feet. That's what the running store. So I walk in. This woman is like, oh, you're training for a marathon. You're a runner. And I remember telling her, I'm like, I'm not a real runner. I'm just running this marathon and I'm never going to run after. And sh this is a conversation that like still takes place. And I talk to people now like, you're, how can you call, not call yourself a runner? You're training for a marathon. But for me, it was imposter syndrome. I'm not good enough to be a runner. Now with Gen Z, which is like, I, and I almost cringe talking about this because all marketers want to talk about is like, how do you talk to Gen Z? Uh, but a real thing is like people are not siloed in their identity in sport. We have this like fluidity of identity and fluidity of passion. People are people run and they do Pilates and they weightlift and they do this. We have the, the hybrid athlete trend, which is a great example of this. I run and I can lift heavy weights. Uh, and so now I feel like people don't want to be siloed as runners because they don't want to be considered one thing. They view themselves as like very dynamic, multi-dimensional athletes or people. So trying to put a label on them and then us trying to market them with this label of runner is not resonating with, with like a, a younger consumer. But I don't know, you're Gen Z. You tell me, does that, does that resonate with you? This is yeah. my hypothesis. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I just, I, I we're so biased on our own personal way of thinking and yeah, when I hear someone not call themselves a runner, even when they run, I'm like, I just, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why you won't buy into it or believe it. But something I want to go back to and fill out some of your story. Let's go back to June 2004, where you worked for a company called Starcom, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> That's correct. Yep. And you were national media strategy planning for Miller Lite. Okay, so we're talking about all companies within the running industry that you help market for and do all, the, all these sort of things. Take me back to 2004, a year before I was born, um, doing advertising for a beer company. How'd you get to this point? And would that version of Jessica believe me if I was like, you're going to rock the running world in 20 years from now? Oh my gosh. I love that you were not born then. Um, I still drink Miller Lite and I will say it is still my beer of choice. Maybe it's because I'm from Chicago. I'm a Midwest girl. That's what I drink. I mean, in college, I drank all sorts of bad things, but like Miller Lite is the one beer that has stuck with me. If you were to go into my pantry now, just bought a case of Miller Lite. So I don't view these things as discordant because as we know, like runners like to party and runners like to eat really bad foods for them. Um, actually, there was this Instagram interview with DK Metcalf, like this, yes, you know, yes, you know yes. yeah. And he, all he does <laughs> is exactly eat candy. That was yeah. horrifying. So I don't view these things as discordant. Uh, that was just an opportunity. I was actually super happy to get put on the Miller Lite account because I loved the brand and I love the product. So yeah. Did you see yourself? Were you, were you a, now we're getting into, were you a runner? <laughs> I'm glad we just nailed what that definition kind of meant in your opinion. Were you a runner back in 2004? When you were doing I was that? not. I grew okay. up in the arts. So I ran my first marathon in 2009. And before that, it was like, I'd go to the gym, get on the treadmill, run for 20 minutes, hate every second of my life, and then be like, I did it. And that was it. So yeah, for me, when I signed up for my first marathon, I had never run a 5k. I had never really run any distance of any kind. So what was the journey to get to this point and what was your first foot in the door into the industry and were you hesitant with a background and other things i think it started with my personal journey running that first marathon 
And that first marathon like truly changed my life. I know we talk about, again, maybe in the marketing world, we talk about this a lot, but like a marathon can truly <laughs> change your life. Cause for me, I never thought I could do anything like that. And even the journey of training every week being like, no, I'm going to run six miles. Now I'm going to run eight miles. You, I was running longer than I ever had. So it was this like journey of empowerment into race day, crossing the finish line, um, that after I'd run a couple marathons and Tim had as well, we started to think like, this is something we're super passionate about this industry that can really like empower people and transform people. And Tim had started a, a separate business on the side that he was starting to sunset. So he had kind of said, you know, you've had this idea for this business. Is this something that we should explore? I'm extremely risk averse, so it's not something I desired to be. I did not desire to be an entrepreneur, but I think because Tim had that background paired with like my background in marketing that we were like, let's try this. But again, it was a side gig for us. And then he went full time after two years and then I went full time after four to five years. So we kind of slowly graduated into it. I'm sure when we started the business, we're like, if this became something that would be cool, but we never had like a full roadmap. It was like, let's start this, see what happens and kind of go from there. You've had all sorts of unbelievably impressive roles throughout the years, including time at the Atlantic, time at LinkedIn of all places, that's pretty baller. <laughs> and then time at Nike, where you were a digital brand director um, for North America marketing. I'm so curious to hear about that time at Nike. What were some learnings from that time? And I think there's so much like allure and aura to the word Nike. I'm curious how you've taken that experience and put it into your present day. I know that was like 10 years ago, but yeah, looking back that, on that time. That was like the dream job. I thought I would never, ever leave that because everybody who like loves athletics, even if you don't love sport, Everybody grew up like dreaming about Nike as like it, this amazing brand. Um, and at some point when I was doing some like career goal mapping, I was like, what what would be some dream places to work for? And that, that was one of them. Um, it actually is what brought us out to Portland was me trying to get that job. And once I was there, it's all the cool stuff. Like you're on the campus, you have all these benefits. There are these amazing events where they bring athletes in and it's, it's so cool. Um, unfortunately for me, I ended up on a team that was not great and it was pretty toxic. And so Nike had this big fallout, I think in like 2017, where a bunch of people, top level executives got fired. And the first like slew of four people that got fired, one of those people was my boss. So I don't need to like, I'm comfortable talking about it, but I don't need to like run that through the mud. Um, but it was a bad experience and I ended up quitting. So I was working on the Olympics. I was fucking love the Olympics. And uh, yeah, that was just such a horrible experience that after the Olympics was over, I quit. And I was I was at a place where I was like, you know, I've worked enough places to know professionals shouldn't get treated this way. I'm just going to find another job. My life will go on. I think I, was, I had a lot of heartbreak having to leave something that I thought was going to be my dream job. And then that's when I got recruited by Runner's World. So I was like, great, this is super fun. I can still stay in this industry, stay in a passion of mine and just do something totally different. Do you ever look back on that time at Nike and that experience and think, man, you know, it is true that everything works out for the best. I mean, if you had a really good boss and were surrounded by all the types of people you wanted to be around, maybe you'd still be at Nike today. And I've no doubt you would have made a lot of impact there. Maybe their stock wouldn't have gone so much down in the past year if you were there. But like genuinely, you probably wouldn't be doing what you're doing today if things had turned out well. A hundred percent. Like it definitely got me that job at Runner's World. And both of those experiences have been so additive to me at Bibrave. So I do think it, it, it was meant to be. I don't ever regret my time there. And there are some amazing people that I worked with that are still there running major parts of the business and they are amazing people. So I have no doubt like that, you know, with any corporate culture, it just kind of depends. It's a company that's so big. It really depends on who your boss is. And that's like one thing I would tell any professional working in any type of environment is like, you think about the company, but you really have to value the people more because in the end, we're all humans working with other humans, business stuff happens, shit happens, budgets get cut things, you know, but if, as long as you're dealing with somebody who understands a real human interaction, that's what matters. And even now, like in influencer work, the thing I hear the most when like, we'll just do catch up with talent to be like, Hey, how, th how are things going? And the thing I hear the most about um, 
bad partnerships is when people like are not responsive or don't talk to other people like humans. Like, again, there are some things we can't control. I would love to be like, hey, we have a new partnership for you. But in the end, if it falls through, if I can at least treat you like a human, that's what matters because we can't control the budgets and we can't control the stock prices or what, whatever's happening to change like the economic environment. But we can change how we treat you as a person. Talking about your time at Runner's World, which I'm fascinated to talk about. I think you're a managing director there. And I'm so curious to talk to you about it because I think when you were there is probably when I started religiously reading Runner's World. So mm -hmm. in middle school was like when I really started getting into the sport and it was like the cool, sexy thing in my mind of like, yeah, I'd read like running books, but a lot of them were very heavy on science. At that point, social media wasn't too much of a thing and I was way too young to be on it. So I wasn't, I probably knew what Instagram was, but I didn't have a phone, wasn't on it. And so me and my family would go to the library, I feel like quite a bit growing up and I would just get out. I mean, apologies for anyone who lived in Toledo and couldn't find runner's world. It was because they were all in my home. I would like get every <laughs> issue read. I just, it was just so cool to me. Take me through your time at runner's world and building out, you know, what I feel like, and maybe I'm just personally biased here, but it was, it was transformative. It was like the one cool thing in running that I was like excited about every single month. Yeah. So uh, publishing is such a, interesting industry and i was there at a time where like prints was kind of dying down and then some people were really understanding how to evolve into digital content and digital content models and older school magazines struggled so if you think about like digitally native brands so like uh, news outlets that started out as digital publications they probably look and feel a lot different than magazines that started to then publish their content online. Um, so Runner's World falls in that era. I worked at Runner's World when it was owned by Rodale, which was a family owned business. And basically after my time at Runner's World, they ended up selling their entire publishing portfolio to Hearst, which is the uh, company that now owns not only Runner's World, but Bicycling, Bicycling, Men's and Women's Health. Those were all formerly Rodale publications. Uh, my role as a managing director is kind of different than some tr like publishing structures where you have a, uh, an editor who's controlling all the editorial content. You have a publisher that is controlling all the ad sales. They're meeting with the brands, getting them to advertise. And my role was completely new. And it was built to really acknowledge the power of the Runner's World brand. They understood that runners were loyal to this brand and they thought like, there's more that we can do to monetize what Runner's World means to the marketplace. Can you help us build out new parts of our business beyond the traditional publishing model? Because we know that that is struggling so much. So part of that was events. Runner's World used to do a lot of events. They had their own half marathon that used to take place in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, they would do one-off events in partnership with Disney and Marine Corps and the Big Sur Marathon. And then they wanted to build out a training arm because a lot of people back in the day, their first ever training plan they found on, in Runner's World magazine. And they knew there was this era to like, how can we get that to be a part of our business? So I was actually looking at a lot of uh, digital training products to be like, how can we create a digital training product? Now it would be an app back then. It could be an app or it wouldn't have to be. That would say like, if this is your goal, here's a 16 week plan to train for a marathon. How do we adapt it based on how many days a week you're gonna run, you know, your background, like all of that stuff. So basically what Runna is right now, that's what we were trying to build back in 2016, eight years ago. But honestly, my time there was so short because they were, you know, trying to sell. So I just didn't have enough time to really build out that product. Uh, but I was there, like uh, we launched our very first ever Runner's World Boston pop-up. And now the, the Boston Marathon pop-up for Runner's World was one of the first ever on Boylston. And now that's like, everybody does a pop-up. So it's kind of funny to look back to be like, we were one of the first to really start that model and create an experience outside of the expo. And now it's like, yeah, everybody does that. <laughs> In 2024, I guess this will come out in November. And at that point, when you say November, it's like 2025 is here. So basically in the future, in the digital landscape, do you think there's place for something like a runner's world to flourish? And of the brands in the industry, what are some strategies you've seen of successful ones in terms of like just digital marketing or how they've flourished in this ever-changing space that seems to change every week? Yeah. So I think one of the challenges at runner's world when I was there was 
still so much money flowed into magazine advertising. This is going to be super nerdy, but when, when brands pay for advertising, they're paying for a cost per impression. And the cost per impression for a magazine ad was exponentially higher than the industry average on a cost per impression for a digital ad. So you could take that same article, publish it in a magazine that's going to however many subscribers, but the, you know, again, you might be getting five times as much for that doll, for that ad as you would online for whatever reason that our industry has deemed somebody's going to absorb that ad or appreciate it more when they're reading it in print versus online. We are just scrolling past digital ads all the time. So it makes the economics of content so hard, especially when you're a big institution that has to pay for a number of editors versus some of the newer content outlets that have come out like that it can be a little bit more nimble, um, but they also aren't going through the same type of rigor of like how many people are reviewing and editing and approving. And there are pros and cons there too, because sometimes it's so overbearing. So again, I'm not an editor. I can't speak as much to that, but that's why I think Runner's World probably doesn't come off as flexible and as innovative as some of these, you know, the other newer media outlets because of some of the bureaucracy that comes with that type of structure. But I still think it's important. It should be an authoritative institution that we keep. But now that it's part of this huge, you know, publishing company, it's like, can it actually get the investment? Because it's a lot smaller than some of these other brands, but in the running world, it's like such an important brand. From your roles within various of these massive companies, what are some lessons you learned about leadership, positive or negative, depending on the place, that you now integrate into your own role as a leader within your company? Oh, that's a very good question. I think personally, one thing I've loved about stepping into our industry versus where I used to li live, which is like the Atlantic and LinkedIn, a lot of like more business thought leadership. Um, I tend to be a fairly like, down to earth communicator. I feel like old school business is very hierarchical. And so you have this like increasing layer of formality as you get more senior within an organization. And that's not my style. So I think I've really enjoyed working in our industry where I'm like, I can be a boss ass bitch, but also be super comfortable talking to anybody at any level and relating to anybody at any level. And I think that is important uh, when you look at like old school institutions like financial institutions or the oil industry. Uh, I used to like those used to be my clients and you're kind of forced into this like formality. And to me, that sometimes just seem, seems and feels like a waste of time. So I, I also think that like younger generations want to feel like you're connecting with them. And I enjoy just like, again, working with everybody in my company or in any organization, no matter what the seniority is. So I don't know if that's a leadership lesson, but I think it's more of a difference in style and approach. Um, and I think the other thing is, as I've matured, I'm not going to say get, gotten older, as I've matured, um, I think a younger style of leadership and also just a younger professional wants to have used to want a lot of structure. We get asked a lot, like, what is your three-year plan? What is your five-year plan? How do you map up all the steps? And I think in my brain, I always thought for my career, if I do this, then this will happen. If I do this, this will happen. And something that I've learned, especially through my time at Be Brave, but also as a, a lesson of marathoning. I know I'm talking a lot about marathoning and a lot of your listeners are more track uh, followers, but um, you could do everything you want in a plan and the result is still not going to happen. You can I could hit all of my times in a trading plan, but you never know what's going to happen on race day. And that doesn't mean race day was a failure. It's like I've, I've, I've gained the fitness. I learned something and I'm going to apply that to what's next. And it's in the same happens in a professional situation. I think for Bibrave, we have learned that while we want to have a plan and a goal, trying to be too rigid to a plan would not give us the flexibility to shift our business to the needs of what the industry is. So when we started, our business was actually a race review site. We have, if you go to bibrave.com, I think it's like forward slash race reviews, we're actually sunsetting this part of our 
site soon, it was going to be a Yelp or a TripAdvisor, but for races. And then we started to get ambassadors on social media to promote it. We started to work with brands to get products to our ambassadors to give them stuff to promote our brand. And then we realized, like, actually, there's a huge model here we should leverage. And that is our business now. Uh, but if we had been so stern on needing to continue to build out this race review site, our our business would be totally different. Um, so I always try to bristle and like push against people who will want very specific plans because sometimes I we can be obsessive about following the plan and lose sight of like opportunities that might be presenting themselves. Something I would love to hear you hit on is, you know, majority of this podcast is younger listeners. We'll definitely have some older listeners out there too, but they'll probably still find this question somewhat interesting. I think so many of a younger population who is invested in running, specifically if they're in high school or college, thinks the only way to stay in the sport is to run competitively. So mm -hmm. make it either like D1 in college, no other option, um, which is another conversation for another time, or run professionally. Like that's the, that's the only way to work with a Brooks or the only way to have any sort of impact or just like the only space in the industry. Something I love about you and what you do is you've shown that there is so much more space to create things that positively impact the sport and also keep your foot in the sport that you love. Can you elaborate on for a younger listener out there that if you are not running Olympic times, but you're really passionate about the sport, you can create things and join things that are within the sport, but a little, yeah, you're not going to be running the Olympics and that's okay. Yeah, totally. Especially the running industry is quite vast. So I feel like people are most familiar with the, yeah, at your point, the professional side where you could either run professionally, you could go into sports marketing, you're probably familiar with your local running store. So there's a lot of people who used to run competitively in high school or college that then start their own running store or work for a running store. Uh, but there's either working for the brands and then working for events. We know so many people who used to run a lot who then started event organizations. That, I'm not going to lie, is quite hard <laughs> because races do not make a ton of money. And so either you're running a huge, huge race, which is pretty rare, or you're an event organization that puts on a ton of smaller races. And they're very, very scrappy. So if you like to be extremely scrappy, there isn't a whole event world out there for you where you can learn operations, how to work with the city to create permits, how to market races and events. Um, on the brand side, obviously things open up quite a bit because you have people who are creating product, product design. Obviously within that there's like materials innovation. You have supply chain people. You have people who are working on demand. Demand planning is like figuring out how many shoes should we order? What regions should they fall into? Um, so that if you're into that kind of, if that sounds interesting to you. And then the marketing side, I feel like is super common. People making the ads, finding out where to place them. Um, and that's not even like all the different functions that would exist within some of the major brands. I will say though, within running, other than the big footwear companies, most companies are in this like small to medium sized business. But I think in our brains, we just think of like the Nikes or the, you know your Brooks, your New Balance. Um, most other brands like, like a Nathan water bottle or, uh, you know, I'm trying to think whatever small gear, uh, even a goo, these are much, much smaller businesses, but they're still having like to have a variety of functions for their business to run. So um, I would say you should want to subscribe to industry newsletters. A lot of jobs get posted on Running USA. Um, there is a, a newswire called Endurance Sports Wire that also gets a lot of job postings. So just subscribe to some of these things to see there's always a job posting list to be like, what type of jobs are getting posted on these industry wires? Click through, read the job descriptions, and I think it'll give you a good sense. And if any of them sound interesting, if you're at the high school level, that might help you decide, oh, I could major in this functional thing that could then work for a shoe or fitness or running brand. Um, so yeah. Hopefully that's helpful. Speaking on that job aspect, outside of probably being very good within marketing and having some sort of expertise and knowledge within it, when you're hiring, what is the number one attribute you look for in a potential future employee? Okay. I don't know if all companies will feel this, but I'm going to share a piece of advice that I, I 
just run into a lot. We get a lot of applications where people are just like, I love running, so I'd be great at for, to work for Bibrave. And to me, that can sometimes be a red flag because having a passion for the sport is so different than working in the sport. Like in working in the running industry, but working in any industry, it's a grind. So you actually have to love, again, the function, the actual thing that you're doing, regardless of the sport. And then your passion for the sport should bring different expertise, a different, a, a more like specialized perspective. So if I'm creating a, a social media ad, me as a runner is going to create something that ideally resonates better with the runner. Or if I'm thinking about demand, again, I'm not a supply chain expert, so <laughs> hopefully no supply chain experts are listening to your podcast, but I might think about the seasonality of running in a region different than somebody who isn't a runner. So I think position your passion as an expertise, not as just a hire me because I love running. Because we've had a lot of people come work for Bibrave who love running, but didn't love the business of it. And I think there's only one person on our team who is not a traditional runner. Most people do love the sport, but they're not leading with that as a reason to hire them. You've obviously created this incredible company over the last 12 years and work with some of the biggest brands in the industry and just do all sorts of amazing things within the sport. There's a quote I came across a few weeks ago that I absolutely love and I think anyone in your shoes would resonate with, just people who have built things. The quote is, Everyone is jealous of what you've got. No one is jealous of how you got it. Can you share some of the journey and ups and downs to get to this point and why? Yes, people are probably jealous of all the companies you get to work with, the success you've had, but no one knows anything about what it's taken to get there. For sure. Especially owning a business and you operate your own thing. The, the highs are so high, but the lows are so low. And I don't think people really understand, like the idea of owning a business is glamorous, but one, people who own their business, it's not a given that you're making a lot of money or you're making good money. But I think as a society, we glamorous, glamorize the idea of being a business owner. There's so much administrative bullshit that comes <laughs> with running your own business for like insurance, legal stuff, I, I could go on. Um, so again, that's where you have to, you do have to like it enough where it's worth it to go through all of that stuff. Um, and I will say having to weather the ups and downs, like you might have a great year, but you have to prepare for the years where you're not. So again, just making sure that you are being conservative enough in your planning, but also like that's something people don't see. They only see the successes and they don't see like, oh, the years during the pandemic where events went away and we lost however much percent of our business, um, things like that. And, and as a business owner, Bibrave actually didn't furlough any of our employees. We were at a time where like our team was so strong and thankfully Tim and I, we planned conservatively enough where at the time, a lot of the news was about businesses who had like two months of capital, which means you only have enough money to run your business for two months. I'm like, I think we have like two years of capital. Like we are so, so conservative. And we thought like, we love our team so much. We'd rather be very strong coming out of the pandemic versus everybody else who would have furloughed and then trying to build their businesses back up. So that was a conscious decision we made, but that was a big investment. But that's a hard choice to make. If you're a business owner and you have to furlough employees, that sucks. Like I would say we deal with, you know, any client, agency relationship, you're always going to deal with client stuff and, you know, losing business. But the hardest, hardest thing is like working with people and like dealing with their, their personal lives and emotions. Um, and I, we take that very seriously. So we have never, I think in 12 years, there's only one time we've ever had to let someone go. And that was due to a performance issue, not because of a business issue, uh, because I'm sure that day will come, but I'm going to avoid it as much as possible. The idea that we would have to let someone go because we didn't hit our numbers or whatever happened else happened from a business reason. Talking about your running here to close out the conversation. We brought it up multiple times in this conversation, but putting more of a spotlight on it, you've done so many marathons throughout the years. I think your PR is like 321 something. So very, very fast. I know you've done some ultras, like I think a few 50 Ks and a 50 mile or all sorts of crazy stuff. What's the most memorable race and why that race? It's going to be a very specific memory. Uh, probably Chicago. Well, 
I have two, one not as happy, one happy. So I'll start with the not as happy and then we'll start with the happy. My very first Boston Marathon was Boston 2013, the year of the bombings. And I, so I will always remember that because it was such a like crazy, crazy time. I finished before the bombs went off and I don't even remember hearing them go off because I was in the finish area, but I was in like a getting my gear check bag. I only know the time they reported the bombs went off. I remember looking at my watch. You got your gear check bag from a bus. And I remember looking at my phone, texting Tim, being like, I finished. I'll meet you in the family meeting area. He had run that year too, but he's much faster than me. So had finished much before me. Um, and that feeling of like, we got together, he had gotten a text from a college buddy being like, hey, are you and Jess okay? And he's like, oh yeah, Jess didn't have a great race that day, but we're good, we just met up. And we actually found out via text. He was like, there were bombs at the finish line. And you could see like everybody just getting that notification and being like, we need to get out of this area as soon as possible. But I had had such a bad race, I could barely move. So it was like this weird, feeling of like, oh, we need to get out. I, my body can fu can't function. It was so cold. Everybody's getting crazy. So obviously I, I will never forget that. Um, and we both got to come back and run the next year, the year Meb won, which was very, very meaningful. So just again, it was a crazy moment in everybody in the running world's lives. And so I, I will never forget that. Um, on a happier note, Chicago 2014, I had run my very first 50 miler, my only 50 miler, three weeks before. I signed up for Chicago because all of my running friends were doing it. So I was like, sure, I'll be trained enough to run 26 miles after I just ran this 50 miler. And um, so throughout the fall, I had joined all of my friends' speed workouts. So I was still getting speed work in, but then doing like low and slow on the trails. So I thought like, at the time, this is getting super nerdy. My PR was like a three, at the time, my PR was a 335, and I thought, I'm just going to try to run eights. Eights would be a 330, and I'll see how long I last, and if I need to slow down, I'll just slow down because I don't really care about this race. And that day, I was like, 758s, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling great. How about I speed it up a little bit, speed it up a little bit, and then by the time I got to mile 20, I was like, I'm still feeling really good. Most of the time, you know whether or not you feel good or not by mile 20, so I really started to pick it up. And then I think my last mile was like a seven minute mile and I ran like a 325. Wow. And out of 26 marathons, I maybe have three races that I've ever finished feeling so good. And it's, so, it's such a cruel race because I'm like, again, I could have trainings where I did every single workout to pace. I hit every single one and my race completely blows up. And I've either had really explosive races or really great ones. So I'm not like missing by a little bit. I'm like missing my goal by 30 minutes because some crazy shit has happened. So it was just this feeling of like, how did this happen so naturally that I just happened to be in such great shape to PR by a significant amount um, with what seemingly was very little effort, though obviously a lot of effort was put in because I was putting so many miles on my legs and it probably was like that adaptation of running much longer than I had before. Jessica, final question for you today. Feel free to take it in whatever direction you want. What would be the final takeaway message that you want to leave with the audience today? Oh, that is a tough question. Uh, I think especially for your listeners, I want them to know that like this industry is so diverse. There's a lot of opportunity for people and that um, to really explore some of the different opportunities in the industry. Like I mentioned, there's the brand side, which people are familiar with, but there's a whole network of running stores and retailers and a whole network of running events. And even I didn't mention like, there are a ton of companies that support, support running events. You have people who are selling them shirts and bibs, Timing races, that is a whole huge industry I was not even familiar with. Uh, there are people who are running registration companies. So when you're registering for races, there are a number of registration platforms. So if you sign up for the industry newsletters and wires, you'll start to get familiar. And I think it'll open up more opportunities for them. Um, and then I think uh, I want everybody to become an advocate for the industry. Like the people that you talk to that are running, that don't call themselves runners, we need to like start that narrative so people can start to realize they're runners. Because one, 
they should feel empowered to say so and do so. It's not something that should be gatekept and it's not gatekept. Um, and I think that would help the industry as a whole. Jessica, final question for you. The question I ask every single guest on every single episode, if you had Gordon Ramsay coming over to your house for dinner, what would you choose to make for him? I, so I am of Taiwanese descent. And so I'd probably do something that he wouldn't necessarily know how to cook. Um, and beef noodle soup is a specialty. Uh, it's like a very famous dish in Taiwan. So I may make a pretty decent beef noodle soup and I would make that for him. Dang, that's one of the best responses I've heard. <laughs> Pulling out all the stops to impress Gordon. Most people are like, I have no clue what I'd make. I would uh, order something. Okay, one final, final question for you. Um, this rarely happens where you get a second bonus one, but today is Halloween as of recording this. And if you saw me look over to my side uh, during this episode, it was because there was some random kid in a massive dinosaur <laughs> costume. So two questions for you in... And uh, respect for Halloween, because I will probably only ever record, you know, one episode a year on Halloween. Um, two questions for you off the top of my head. One, best Halloween costume you've ever had throughout your years of life. And two, favorite Halloween candy, even if you don't eat candy present day. Just just pick one for the sake of yep. it. Yep. Um, for Halloween, I should show you, I wore my Halloween shirt. It says, I'm just here for the booze. So I just want to make sure that... <laughs> Uh, we can appreciate this. I'm just here for the booze shirt. Uh, my favorite Halloween candy is probably Snickers. I love a Snickers, chocolate, peanut butter, caramel. Can't go wrong. Favorite Halloween costume. I used to do a lot of Halloween costumes. I always think a Halloween costume is made best with a group because one costume could be great, but the power of many people together dressed up. And uh, my best friend, his birthday was always November 2nd. So we'd always do a big like outing for his birthday. And one year we did Star Wars. And I think we had over like, it was like 12 to 15 people dressed up wow. as different unique characters. So it was a like, really, really great scene. Um, so yeah, and I dressed up as R2-D2 that year. That was my Amazing. contribution to Star Wars. That's awesome. Well, Jessica, really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me and share all these insights from your incredible journey and story. And just want to thank you personally for all the amazing work you're doing. It was such an honor to work with your company earlier this year. I was so impressed. Um, and I know that was 0.0001% of what you do and what you've done. And I can't wait to continue to follow along uh, you personally, as well as the company and its inevitable success in the years to come. Yeah, no, thank you so much for inviting me on and um, hopefully this was helpful to your listeners.